I've made this video before, at least twice. I spent every minute of my free time researching, writing and editing this long comprehensive video on this band that I loved, only to realize that I created something I hated. I hated it because it was dishonest, not factually or biographically, that was all fine, but it wasn't what I had wanted it to be. I wanted to present the band in a way that I saw them and as I heard them. Because Deftones the band goes far beyond just what they are as an institution, a four, sometimes five piece band from Sacramento, California. They're a band whom I quote on a daily basis and whose CDs and cassettes with their name on it I've worn down to the point of destruction because I like them that much. So in the spirit of anarchy, I present a raw, unbridled look at the music of a band that still to this day amazes me. The band hails from Sacramento, California, an area best known for producing a number of great influential post-hardcore and alt-rock bands. From hardcore punk pioneers Bad Brains to post-hardcore giants like Jawbox and Faith No More, the area has no shortage of good bands. And it's also why it's no surprise that it served as a breeding ground for bands such as Deftones. Now, before we begin, it's probably best that we talk about new metal. Look, whether or not you believe that the label is poisonous, it is a valid descriptor for a lot of the bands that found fame in the late 90s and early 2000s. On the matter of whether or not Deftones are a new metal band, I'll say this. New metal died a long time ago, and it took a lot of bands with it, none of which are Deftones, which says something. It's probably worth talking about the Like Linus EP, not for its innovation or even its overall quality, but mainly for the historical document that it is. There are touches of what Deftones would become on this album. There's a restlessness to the music that I think is actually quite interesting. Marino's vocal styling switches up from one style to another on a per song basis. The same goes for the music. On the first four tracks, he goes from sounding vaguely like James Maynard Keenan to sounding a little like Mike Patton, and then a teensy bit like the guy from Incubus. And I say none of that with derision. Like I said, it's mainly as an historical document that this is important. Because the leap from Like Linus to the debut is actually quite impressive. I'm going to be honest with you here and say that the band's first two albums are amongst what I would consider their weakest which I guess is not an unpopular opinion. A lot of listeners start with White Pony and skip right over these first two records, which is perfectly understandable. That being said, Adrenaline and Around the Fur, despite being less experimental and a little more straightforward, are not without their highlights. If you're into bone-crushing guitar riffage and devilish howls, then Adrenaline has you covered. Even though I'm impartial to the record as a whole, songs like Board Lifter and Engine No. 9 are undeniably good. But where I find this album most intriguing is at the tail end with the closing track For Real, because it's where the band hints at something a little more nuanced. The first few minutes of For Real resemble a lot of what's on the album already, but all that changes around the three minute mark where the song enters this extended outro. The music softens a little and Marino abandons the shrill scream that he's been using on most of the album. The lyrics take on another tone as well, a tone that I found awfully familiar. One that showcases that unique blend of darkness, prettiness and sincerity that Marino is known for.
I think it's fair to say that White Pony is really where Deftones came into their own, which puts Around the Fur in a rather odd position. It's an album that bridges that gap between what the band was and what they would later become. It also produced two of the band's most well-known singles, My Own Summer and Be Quiet and Drive are amongst the band's most popular songs. Interesting though how these two songs are almost opposite in mood and texture. My Own Summer is a tortured alt metal headbanger, while Be Quiet and Drive is a song that seems to blend soft 90s alt rock with intense and dark music. It's a song that's deceptive in a lot of ways. With the pretty consonant guitar chords and Marino's crooning voice, it's probably easy to overlook how sinister the song actually is. On the surface it reads like a sweet, somewhat lulting love song, but the lyrics paint a much darker picture. It's easy to paint over that line because it's a bit ambiguous, but in the context of the track as a whole, with other lines like, it feels good to know you are mine, it takes on a different meaning entirely, and hints at something a lot more unsettling. And that's what lead singer Chino Marino has always been good at. He creates these characters and provides this imagery that never really fit neatly into one box. In other words, something that looks sweet on the outside may not look that way on closer inspection. The two lyrical themes that he visits the most are sex and violence, two things that often are diametrically opposed but that share commonality. Commonality that he exploits in songs like Labia and Die the Flu, both of which are standouts on this record. To complicate matters a bit though, Marino is never really clear or open faced about his songs. Everything is always veiled or communicated in a way that makes it hard to tease apart. Distinctions that would become a lot less clear on the next album. I'm tempted to be a contrarian asshole and say right off the bat that White Pony is not Deftones best album, but that would be a lie. It may not be my personal favorite, but it is, at this point in time, the best, most consistent album the band has delivered. The same way that OK Computer hangs like a noose over the rest of the Radiohead discography, White Pony is the standard against which other Deftones albums are measured. If you have not, I implore you, go back and listen to Adrenaline, Around the Fur, and then do White Pony again. The chasm of difference between those albums and this record is mind-bendingly big. Around the Fur gave the band a foot in the door, and then the band used that opportunity to make an album that made very little sense on paper. This album should not have worked. To put all of that into context, you have to have an idea of what the musical landscape in 2000 looked like. Corn, Limbiscuit, and Slipknot. That's what people were listening to. That was the zeitgeist. Dry, fuzzy guitars, slap bass, and record scratches. Those were the dominant sounds of that era. To which Deftones responded by offering an album that leaned heavily on dream pop textures and trip hop electronics. That alone makes this record fascinating. It was nowhere near what people were expecting, and yet it became one of the best reviewed, most revered albums of the decade. The mood of this record definitely leans towards darkness. It's nocturnal, and seemingly always on edge, but at the same time it's dreamlike. Qualities that I think are really well encompassed in the opening track, Fitziera. The tinny guitars and fast grooves lend an edge to the song, but it also has this unmistakable smoothness to it. A smoothness that makes the transition into digital bath an easy one. This is really the point where the album goes from promising to fucking great, and I don't mean that lightly. To listen to this record and not be completely blown away by digital bath is impossible. The song is intense, but at the same time sweet. It's a masterfully written song that immediately separated the band from their contemporaries. 
every element of this song is so perfectly arranged. The groove, the space around the drums, the way the bass and the guitars enter with this rumble. It's one of those songs that could never have been written by another band. It's so uniquely Deftones. The way the whispered vocals and the lyrics hint at something more is amazing. It's also worth noting that some of Marino's most intense songs use water metaphors, something that will definitely show up again later. They then follow that track with Elite, one of the most abrasive songs on the album. Amazingly, the only song off the record that won a Grammy. It is frantic and unhinged. 2000s Metal has this reputation for being a lot more processed than the stuff that came before it. And Elite is certainly processed. But none of that detracts from how heavy the song feels, how much energy is packed into this four minute track. The song Korea is on a similar spectrum, but I find it a bit more interesting than Elite. It's a song that goes from sounding sinister to just outright deranged in a way that makes it hard not to love while also reminding you that at the end of the day, Deftones is a metal band. They may not be traditional in their approach to the genre, but their far-reaching experimentation makes things interesting. Take for example the drum work on songs like Oryx Queen and Street Carp. Oryx Queen opens up with this off-kilter percussion groove that I think really leads well into the song, while Street Carp features this off-time, off-meter drum thing that is fantastic. Street Carp is also notable for having some of the most entertaining lyrics on the album. Marino's delivery lies somewhere between sincere and sarcastic, and the general attitude of the song is really quite brilliant. The sparser instrumentation also gives you a chance to really enjoy Stephen Carpenter's excellent guitar work. Those dense, fussed out guitar riffs that would in any other context sound menacing, sound snug, especially against Marino's voice. And speaking of his voice, the song Teenager is undoubtedly the most surprising cut on the album. According to the stories I've heard, it was written by Marino when he was 15 and was originally meant to be included on Marino's side project, Team Sleep. All of which makes sense, but I do like its inclusion here. It actually serves as a really nice segue into the next track on the album. I consider Knife Party to be this album's centerpiece. Besides being the best song on the album, Fight Me, it also embodies the soul of the record like no other song. The way the abrasive guitar textures melt into the smoother elements of this track is fucking incredible. It's a mix that really shouldn't work. It should sound like a mess, but it doesn't. It's perfect. And to add to all of that, the song doesn't even really get good up until the 2 minute 50 mark. I mean holy fucking shit that howling female falsetto that comes in and just gets more and more intense as the song builds to that last final chorus is incredible. There's a point where Marino's voice re-enters and he's just singing, I could float here forever. Literally the most perfect thing he could have said in that moment. The lyrical allusions to blood and knives sound almost innocent when paired with the music. None of it sounds malicious, rather it's almost religious actually, ritualistic in a way. Which is actually a running theme throughout this record and the band's later work. The band does it again on the song Change in the House of Flies. This is the first Deftones song I heard and therefore the song that drew me into the band in the first place. Like Knife Party, the song blends together a number of different textures and moods. The song differs in its mood though. It's darker, still somewhat sacrilegious, but much, much darker. It's a mood that is so effectively created by the howling synth tones and Marino's vocal delivery. His voice sounds murderous almost, compressed to the point that it sounds like it's right up against your ear. It's intimate in a way that emphasizes the lyrical content of the song. There are a number of layers here, like the mood of the music and his vocal delivery that further obscure the meaning. Which means that Marino doesn't sound evil when he's saying evil things. 
The one line really worth examining is where he sings. It's a line that colors the rest of the lyrics, making it clear that what he's describing is unholy, sacrilegious. For the sake of time, I won't speculate any further than that, but I think it's clear just from the overall mood of the track that what is being described is far from innocent. For those not aware, the song Back to School Mini Maggot was not included on the original cut of this album. What Back to School is, is a song commissioned by the record label because they needed a catchier single to release in promotion of the album. So the band sampled their own song Pink Maggot, the last song on this album, and Marino spit some bars over it. The reason I bring this up, other than for the sake of clarity, is because the chorus of Back to School features prominently the lines, Back at school, we are the leaders of all. Transpose or stop your lies. And it's interesting to note how the meaning of this line changes somewhat from Pink Maggot to Back to School. Back to School is cocky and in your face, while Pink Maggot is a bit more reserved. No less intense, just more toned down. It's a quiet song that broods for the first few minutes. What Back to School misses though is the first stanza that Marina repeats before the song explodes into its chorus. I'll stick you enough to take your oxygen away. Then I'll set you on fire, cause I'm on fire. It's a lead up that changes the way the chorus is meant to be interpreted. Push back the square now that you need her, cause back at school we are the leaders of all. Transpose or stop your lies. Like with the song Change in the House of Flies, I have no definitive statement to make about the meaning behind each and every line. They're ambiguous and I think purposefully so. There are a lot of other things in this album that I would have loved to talk about. For one, the bass guitar work, Chi Cheng's playing is incredible. Due to the nature of the instrument though, his bass work often goes unnoticed. But they're every bit as important as all the other parts of the music. The same goes for Abe Cunningham's drumming and Delgado's synth work. Everything about the music just works and it's also consistent throughout. I get that this is still some people's favorite Deftones album and that's perfectly acceptable. This album is undeniably good and difficult to top, but it's not my favorite though. We'll get to that. I've discussed this album before in another video, so I'm not going to say all that much. If you're curious as to my thoughts on the album, go watch that video. It's a record that is admittedly very flawed and unbalanced, but somehow that makes me like it more. This album is tense and abrasive and pretty all in the same sentence and unapologetically so. The music barely congeals but works just long enough that songs like Battle Axe and Death Blow exist. Songs where divergent moods, tones and textures meet to make something completely unique. It's a mess, but it might also be the most accurate representation of the band as an enigma. Something that shouldn't work but inexplicably does. Saturday Night Wrist shares a lot of the same characteristics as the self-titled release. Except that where the self-titled is moody and temperamental, Wrist is just straight up unhinged, disjointed. It's not so much that the moods and textures switch rapidly, it's that they all seem to be occurring at once. I think the song that illustrates this best is Kim Dracula. Note how in the chorus, Marino's voice switches between singing and screeching with a small portion of digitally affected shouting, all within the span of 4 seconds, while a wall of guitar and bass rumbles beneath it. Beware does the same thing, but Beware does it with less pomp. 
the mood is, generally speaking, rather foreboding, but then the chorus hits and there's a few seconds of outright bliss. Interestingly, at this point, Marino sings, In other words, the most threatening part of the song occurs over the most blissful guitar work. Musical and lyrical ambiguity has always been a feature of the band, but this album displays a somewhat unwieldy mixture of those two distinct atmospheres. I mean, for God's sakes, the song Beware, the one with all that blissful atmosphere, has perhaps the heaviest fucking outro of any track on the record. That's kind of what made me fall in love with this album in the first place. It's messy and there are moments that don't really work all that well, but when they do work, they are fucking great. Like the first chorus, for example. What's interesting about Hole in the Earth is that it also shines a light on exactly why this album feels as unstable as it is. I look back and go like, wow, we were pretty well, we were We were in no condition whatsoever to even, to, you know, to even make a record, you know, and we weren't, there was, we weren't speaking, there was no communication, and, and his defense, man, you know, I mean, you know, he's used to working with, you know, and it was horrendous. Yeah, there was no, like, a regimen at all. It was very much like do as little as you can to just get to, to feel like you're doing your part and then that's it and th and that's what the record i think kind of sort of represented was like at the end is like or or just like in life you know like what you put into something is what you get out of it and what we put into that record is what we got out of it you know what i mean it's like pr pretty much and it's you know it's it's on us and 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 i honestly don't think the record is that bad i mean it's you know but um but that's the least connected record of all our records as far as like like, yeah. uh, it's so sporadic. I mean, it was like you said, it was recorded with different producers. I mean, like, probably like yeah. three different producers. Um, the record company's put me with all these songwriters, which is weird. It's crazy how, with all the chaos surrounding the recording of this album, it came out as good as it did. It may not be perfect, but it's still a Deftones record, and that says a lot. It also managed to produce quite a number of hits. Cherry Waves is one of those hits. It's my personal favorite off of this record, and I'm sure that that's true for a lot of other people as well. The song follows Beware, which is an interesting placement. Beware is a song that uses water as a symbol for violence and retribution, while Cherry Waves uses it to depict something a lot more depressing. It's a song that is incredibly heavy and has this big anthemic chorus but has this generally soft demeanor to it. The lyrics seem to describe this toxic, one-sided relationship. I love the way Marino opens the chorus of the song. If like you should sink beneath, I'll swim down, would you? It may seem like a small, inconsequential addition, but the inclusion of that word like in the chorus is important. Intentionally or not, it gives off this air of shyness, of coyness, like the character he's portraying is afraid of asking the question in the first place. The most striking lyric, however, shows up deeper into the song. Brilliance lies in how powerful of a metaphor this is to illustrate what it's like being beaten down by another person. A person you'd be willing to do anything to help, but who would not be willing to return the same favor. The almost literal portrayal of the weight of another person dragging you down to the depths of despair is fantastic. 
and is a testament to the fact that Marino is a good songwriter. My first big issue with this album arises with the song Mine. There are parts of the song that I definitely like. It's in an odd time signature and it's got Serge Tankian on it, but it's such a clear tonal break from the four songs that preceded it that it kind of comes out of nowhere. In comparison to the rest of the album, it's almost unbelievably clean, especially the guitars. The bass is lifted a bit more into the mids and the guitar sit a bit higher in the mix as well. It just doesn't sound in tune with the darker, murkier aesthetic of the album. On its own, it's a fun time, but it sits awkwardly in the track list. Other than an UrbanDictionary.com entry, there isn't a reliable definition for the term Saturday Night Wrist. Rumor has it that it's a nerve damage you get after falling asleep with your wrist in a weird position, usually after a night of getting wasted and or high. But there really isn't any substantiation for that, other than the clear references to substance use on the album. References that I think are most clear on the song Xerxes. Not a track I immediately loved, but one that grew on me. It's a song where the subtleties really sell the track. Chino's vocals do the same thing they do on Kim Dracula, morphing and changing on a split second basis, all while delivering what is probably the most solid vocal melody on the album. The music in the verse is sparse and dreamy, and it maintains its quality up until the chorus kicks in. There's a line that comes up in the second verse that I think really sheds a light on the song. The music has this lulting quality to it, like you're drifting off into space. But the lyrics, that one in particular, are quite sobering. Kim Dracula has a similar message, though a bit more coded. I love the way that it starts off though. The earth will see our eyes go blank tonight. There's just something great about that line and the image that it paints. It's pretty, but also quite scary. And the same goes for the chorus. I really wish these snakes were your arms. The most literal way to interpret this is to assume that snakes equals needles and that needles equals drugs. And maybe that's true, but Marino's words are rarely ever concrete and without nuance. On a now archived bio page on the Yamaha website, he's quoted as saying the following. My lyrics don't deal with specific topics. I write down on paper the feelings of the moment. It's not easy to explain the content of the lyrics or to give a logical sense to the words. And although the contents may not be explainable, the feelings or the emotions behind it are clear. And that's really all the explanation that's required. If beware is unwieldy and a bit messy, rats 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 is just straight up schizophrenic. The post-hardcore edge on the verses somehow gel well enough with the breezy chorus that the song feels cohesive, despite the tonal shifts. There is a point during the bridge when the whole thing becomes almost tribal. It's a fascinating track that has some really great moments, like the way Marino delivers the line, everything is fine with his guttural scream. It is one of those songs that only Deftones could really get away with. I guess at some point we have to talk about the song Pink Cell Phone. It's a track where I feel like the band might have gone a step too far. The first three minutes are passable and don't really bother me all that much. I kind of get the premise of the whole thing. But the last minute is just not a fun listen. The album ends on a soft note. Despite starting off rather harmless, the track Riviera is just as undecided as the rest of the record. Its general moodiness is actually what makes this track as enduring as it is. Believe it or not, I think Saturday Night Wrist is the closest thing to White Pony that the band has ever done. It's far less consistent than White Pony and takes a lot more risks. And it's that risk taking that can put some people off. And that's completely understandable. But the thing that makes Wrist enduring is the same thing that made White Pony enduring. That unlikely mix of different moods and textures. And though this record is far less polished, 
than White Pony and is therefore a more challenging listen, it nonetheless earns its place in the band's discography. This is sort of where my journey begins. My discovery of this band coincided with the release of this record. I actually vividly remember the first time listening to this album, perhaps because that moment marks the beginning of a journey. It was the starting point for a sequence of events that led me to make this video in the first place. What sweetens the memory even more though is the fact that Deftones are one of the few bands that were really mine. Most of the bands or artists I grew up listening to at the time were bands that my father liked or that family members introduced me to. Deftones was something I enjoyed, and this album was, by extension, one of the first albums that I loved. It's probably a weird starting place in the band's discography given that Diamond Eyes is not White Pony, but what remains true on this record and has remained true across the band's discography is that regardless of the record and regardless of the moods and the atmospheres, Deftones is pretty much still Deftones. Deftones have always been heavy, but Diamond Eyes is a lot more than just heavy, it's jagged. The distortion is dry and brittle while the syncopation is sharp. It's as if the music has these physical edges to it, these angular passages that are present even in the softest of songs. There's the sensation that some of the layers that were originally there on albums like Wrist have been peeled back and we're left with a sparser record. It's interesting to note that this album opens with the four heaviest tracks on the record. The transition between the song Command Control and You Seen the Butcher is one of my favorite moments on this album. Going from that defiant swagger of Command to the murderous groove of Butcher is glorious. I actually don't think Stefan's guitars have ever sounded as heavy as they do on You've Seen the Butcher. It's hands down the part of that track that makes the song. The guitars steal the show and that heavy metal influence really bleeds through in the play. All of this sort of transitions into beauty school in a really unexpectedly amazing way. The song has this very roomy percussion with these paper thin snares and has this groove that is simple but at the same time alluring. Compared to the tracks that preceded it, the mix is notably lighter. The guitars are pulled back and the bass is evened out a bit. There's a watery quality to this song that I think is enhanced by the more reserved production. The song Prince is equally as reserved and as sparse, but it's not as effective though. It's a song that I've always felt needed a bit more. This is going to sound ridiculous and I may be perjuring myself here, but if you have the stomach for it, and if you're bored enough and just aching for more Deftones material, check out the bass nectar remix of the song Prince. And yeah, the remix is kind of a very shitty bro step song, but I think what he does with the song Prince is what I wish the band had done with the song Prince. And although it's not a song I'll skip, and it's a song that has definitely grown on me over time, it is kind of overshadowed by the tracks that come before and after it. Particularly by the song that comes after it, namely Rocket Skates. The chorus to this track is so simple and so to the point that it borders on self-commentary. Guns, razors, knives. The interplay between the drums and the bass in the song is really fantastic. Each punch from that kick hits you right in the middle of your chest and it pairs perfectly with Marino's shrill screaming. Mirroring the opening of the album, the record ends with the four softest songs. Along with it, the production itself also softens quite a bit with this reduction in the dryness and the brittleness of the mix, which is made immediately apparent by the song Sex Tape, a very salacious title for a very pretty song. And although the overall atmosphere is wet and dreamy, the song still hits quite hard, even with those drifting synth tones and the very shimmery guitar textures, the rhythms are still tight. There is a four year gap between the recording of Saturday Night Wrist and this album. A lot happened within that four year gap. Diamond Eyes is the first record by Deftones not to feature the bassist Chi Cheng. 
For the sake of modesty, I won't recount the whole story in detail. Before Diamond Eyes, the band were working on another album under the working title Eros. It was around this point that Chi Cheng was involved in a motor vehicle accident that landed him in a coma and eventually ended his life. So partly out of a show of respect, the band scrapped everything and started over, bringing Sergio Vega on board. I bring all this up not for the sake of drama or to impart some sense of importance to what I'm saying, but because it's integral to understanding the song Risk. While my interpretation of the song is by no means the only way to look at it and is not officially sanctioned by anybody, it is definitely worth interpreting it in the context of Chi Cheng's unfortunate accident. It is a very heartfelt and saddening statement, which the chorus then immediately balances out by being rather optimistic. Another song that is strangely optimistic is the track 976 Evil. This remains one of my favourite Deftone songs and my favourite song from this album. The title references a low budget 1980s horror film and in that way it's a bit of a non sequitur. It mirrors the song's sex tape in its composition. Both are built on the steady running bass line with these guitar arpeggios that make up most of the track's atmosphere. An atmosphere that is strangely spiritual in a way, with the lyrics being this weird mix of abstract and concrete, lending this mysticism to the track. Unlike the three records that preceded it, Diamond Eyes ends on a somewhat heavy note. This Place's Death may not be a heavy track, but that ominous foreboding feel that it has definitely closes the album on a stranger note. Despite the overall heaviness of this album, it's probably the band's most optimistic. Even the really violent, sinister parts sound somewhat gleeful. And perhaps that's a weird way of putting it, but on Diamond Eyes, the band actually sounds healthy. This point in the band's discography is probably the most difficult for me to deal with or to discuss because my feelings about this album are mixed and somewhat confusing. There's a lot that I like about Koino Yokan, but there are definitely parts of this album that I dislike to one degree or the other. What is particularly memorable about Koino Yokan, however, is the overall aesthetic of the album. Things are gauzier and denser but also more distant. It's by far the most shoegaze the band has ever gone. And it's that haze that sort of serves as a point of contention for me personally. It would be difficult to explain to anybody who hasn't heard the album, but the mood of this album is almost too consistent. Despite the numerous changes in tone and atmosphere and even instrumentation, everything still feels more or less the same. All the jagged edges have been sanded down, which, yeah, makes the album flow a lot better than the ones that came before it, but it also diminishes the harsher, more aggressive elements of this album. Which I assume is at least partly what the band intended with this record. The title, translated loosely from Japanese, means premonition of love, and it's a title that fits very neatly on all of this music. Things do, in fact, feel further away in this album. All the instruments meld together in a way they never have before. In a way that it's difficult to distinguish guitar from bass and bass from synth. Viewed more positively, it's a testament to the engineering and the production of this album. That kind of messy but not muddy sound is very difficult to pull off. But when done correctly, as in the case with Koino Yokan, it puts a different flow on the album. But the same things that elevate this record for me are what detract from it, and that's really where my contention lies. 
there's less dynamic range to Koino Yokan. Everything exists in more or less the same sonic spectrum. There's less angularity and therefore less bite. On tracks like Poltergeist and Entombed, that works very well. But on tracks like Graphic Nature and Goes, where that bite is essential, this works less well. But it is a good album, at least when looked at collectively. Its biggest strength is that it's so different from the rest of the band's discography. Those subtle synthesizer touches create a feeling that isn't present on the band's other albums. Things feel very synthetic, but at the same time very nocturnal, with dark tones and soft textures. Music that pairs well with night driving and dystopian cityscapes. It works better as a tone piece than a throw on at any time kind of album meaning that all the songs benefit greatly from the album context. Most of them could easily stand on their own, but they sound much better together than they do apart. And all of this may be due to how this album was written. Like Saturday Night Wrist, the songs seem to shift gears a lot, moving from one sound or rhythm to another almost at will. But on Koino Yokan, these shifts feel more fluid probably because the majority of these songs are written during jam sessions and therefore don't feel as constructed or stitched together as songs off a of Saturday Night Wrist. Not to say that the shifts are in any way subtle, they're still very much unmistakable. Tempest and Rosemary both feature very distinct breaks in tone between the verse and the chorus. On Rosemary, those changes come in waves. The glossy, airy synth intro quickly turns into something a lot darker as the guitars enter. Then the whole thing changes once more as the song enters into the refrain. Marino's voice blends a lot more easily against the denser instrumentation, to the point that it almost tends to get lost. It's there, but so faint that it seems difficult to focus on. But on this record, more than ever, I find myself caring less about what Marino's saying as opposed to how he's saying it. Generally speaking, I tend to favor lyrics over music in a 51 to 49 ratio, but on this album, the polls have shifted somewhat. To put it frankly, I haven't really considered the lyrics on this album at least not as deeply as I did on the other records. Which is at least partly due to the fact that the lyrics on this album appear to be more straightforward than the usual cryptic stuff he writes. But even then, when I put on Koino Yokan, it's not the concrete stuff that I'm really focused on. There are a few exceptions though, and Entombed is one of those. It's a song that will forever be amongst my favorites from this band. From a lyrical standpoint, it's stereotypical of Marino's tonal defiance. The music falls somewhere between dream pop and synthwave, with a very lush, calming atmosphere. That movement later on in the song, where we hear the switch from the sequence drum beats to Cunningham's live kit, is absolutely breathtaking, and is only enhanced by this wave-like synth tone that rises up along with it. The drive, the energy, and the rush that the song creates is enough for me to call it a masterpiece. It's beautiful. The serenity of the music sits so beautifully against the darker tones of the lyrics in the verse. From the day you arrived, I've been safe by your side, in chains, entombed. Koino Yokan has perhaps the most satisfying ending to a Deftones record. The one-two punch created by Goon Squad's dissonant angularity and what happened to use more resonant tones makes for a very satisfying conclusion. The sequence beats that open What Happened to You are immediately reminiscent of the song Oryx Queen, while the rest of the song sits nicely into the newer aesthetic of Koino Yokan, which actually sums up a lot of what I feel about this album. There are these flashbacks back to the band's older sound while also embracing this newer technique and this newer way of making music. And it's why I wouldn't recommend this album to somebody who wanted to know what the band is like, someone new. Because Koino Yokan isn't the first thing that comes to mind when I think Deftones, but 
every now and then when the mood is right and the desire to be swathed and cradled by music becomes too much, this is the album I would choose. Gore is perhaps the band's most contentious album. In comparison to the album before it, Gore is drier and much sparser than Koino Yokan. It seems to shift with the same violent energy as Saturday Night Wrist and cuts just as deep as the most jagged parts of Diamond Eyes. Which is why I would argue that this is the natural endpoint for all the band had done up to this point. Not to say that this is their last record ever because it clearly isn't, but just that gore seems to wrap up a certain part of the band's career. Deftones have never done anything predictable and gore is certainly not what I predicted. In all fairness though, I'm not even sure what I wanted this album to sound like. And even though it came out like a dead, I have a strange inkling that in a few years time, perhaps long after this band has disappeared, people will return to this album and give it the same credit that I give Saturday Night Wrist. Some point in the future where this record's perceived flaws will be regarded with the same reverence as its strongest elements. Not that that excuses anything that this record has done or that it would make up for the fact that this album is dysthymic, labile and difficult to listen to. It is so hard to pin down at any one point in time and it expects entirely too much from the audience while also giving us way more than we deserve. The frustration that this album creates stems entirely from its instability. It's not built for casual listening or as music that you play to your guests. I remember the first listen as being disorientating. I remember being actually confused. The sharp turn that the band takes from the consistently smooth mood of Koino Yokan to the unapologetically angular approach of this album is dizzying. It's a taxing listen and I cannot confidently say that I enjoy every moment on gore. But what I can say is that the music that makes up the moments between my least favorite parts of gore is fucking great. Take for example the song Petura Infamante. I don't like the midsection of the song leading up to the refrain at all. But the intro, the verse and the chorus itself are undeniably good. And some of the discomfort I feel in the final moments of the song before Carpenter's guitar roars through the noise to play that one really cool part is part of the enjoyability. I know that words really capture music accurately, but I find myself agreeing with the Rolling Stone review of this album, where they concluded that the tension created between Carpenter and Marino are the primary reason for this record sounding as undecided as it does. A lot of it does feel tense and subversive. You might even go as far as to say that the ending riff to the song Phantom Bride even sounds a bit vindictive. As if Carpenter was kind of restaking his claim to the music after letting guest Jerry Cantrell play for a little bit. All of this seems to come to a head on the song Rubicon. A song that reads like a plea from one band member to another. Intentionally or not, the way Marino's voice seems to battle for sonic space with Stephen Carpenter's guitar sort of reinforces the idea. But not everything on this album is as contentious though. The two songs that have the two undecided titles, i.e. Prayers, Triangles and Hearts, Wires, are the two most consistent songs on the record. The most normal for Deftones, which just means they're a lot easier to listen to. I like the shimmering guitars in the chorus of the song Prayers and Marino's impassioned singing, but Hearts is probably my personal favorite. It is the most strongly realized song, the most cohesive and the most complete. And the chorus is fantastic. The way the guitar slice through the mix as Marino sings cut through is amongst my favorite moments on any Deftones album. I like a lot of what's on Gore and I have no concrete criticisms to offer other than what I've shared already. I don't think it's a bad release, and any band this far into their career that chooses to experiment is a band worth listening to. I'll end off by saying this. 
If Saturday Night Rust is LSD, then gore is heroin. It's nowhere near as pretty or as glamorous, but the rush is undeniable. Music and art in general are deeply personal things. Therefore, my love for this band is a deeply personal thing. I only hope that by expressing how I feel about the music that they've made, I've somehow stirred something within you. If not, then that's fine. Either way, thank you for watching. Well, it seems that you have made it through to the end of the video. Over here should be some other links to other videos. Uh, go check out my Spotify and Bandcamp if you're into the music. And yeah, follow me on Instagram.